What's up, what's up? This is Caffeinate Your Career, a series where I get to ask experts the questions that you wanna know. I'm your host, Alicia Josie, and today I sat down with Cynthia Dice to talk about careers in art. Cynthia is an artist, she's a writer, and she's an educator. Today our talk was really great. We talked about gaming, pricing your artwork, and what you need to do to get into this industry and really be successful. So come on, check out this chat. <laughs> Yay! I'm so excited that you're here. So you're actually the first person on Caffeinate Your Career. Really? Yes! That's exciting! So, yes. so I'm starting excited. Starting it out. It yes, me happy. starting it out yeah. right. Yeah. Um, so thank you for being here and taking time you're out of your day. You're welcome. You're welcome. Um, so if you're ready for some rapid icebreakers, we'll start with that. Do it. Okay, here Do we go. It. Favorite music artist or band? So I listen to tons of different kinds of music mm -hmm. all the time. Right now, Rhiannon Giddens has okay. been just like constantly playing in my ears so yeah. she's a North Carolina artist amazing oh awesome so, yeah. bookworm or movie buff definitely a bookworm, bookworm? I, I'm always reading at least two books if not three what's your favorite book well that's a good question <laughs> I love this book by Madeline Miller called Circe and it came out a few years ago but I've been telling people about this book for like four years it's huh. so so good it's a retelling sort of it's a it's a story about a minor character in mm -hmm. Homer's Odyssey told from her perspective and it really like brings new life to this really really old story mm. and she's like the first witch so it's totally like an yeah. appropriate seasonal thing yeah i think i had to read the odyssey in high school you did we all did yeah like we all read this horrible thing and it's this long <laughs> it's it's awful like it's it's you know but um this particular this is a character and she really gives some definition because a lot of the female characters in the odyssey are just horrible mm. you know they're they're either you know she's a feminist historian a feminist myth, myth, mythologic myth, mythology historian i'm not actually sure what she does i think she's okay. a classics professor but <laughs> she um she really looks at this character and goes deeper into sort of what her motivations might have been realistic motivations for mm -hmm. this mythological character but it's just super super interesting and beautifully written there are some phrases in that book that just echo in my mind because they're so beautiful oh, so yeah. i highly recommend it I okay. recommend it. Yeah. Mentally writing that one yeah, down yeah, in my notes yeah. app. <laughs> and both the writing, the written book, and if you're an audiobook person, the audiobook is amazing. Okay. The narrator just has like a voice that's like liquid in your ears. It's mm. so beautiful. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. And what are you drinking from BU Cafe today? I'm drinking an oat milk chai. Oh. I don't do dairy. I don't do the cow stuff. Yes. But um, it's, and it's so good. It's really nice and spicy. Yeah. Which I love a spicy chai. Nice. Yeah. And Last one, what time of day do your most creative ideas come to you? Oh, I'm a morning person. Morning person? Sure. Yeah, yeah. I love to get, like, perfect morning for me is I get up, mm -hmm. you know, do, like, a few things around my house. I have dogs and chickens, so there's always some pet oh, maintenance cool. to do every day. And then I go take a walk. And I started about five years ago doing this thing where I walk, I, you know, I listen to a lot of music, listen to audiobooks and things, but I do a walk where I don't have anything in my ears. Although, like actually, that. sometimes I put headphones in so nobody will talk to me. Yeah. <laughs> just so they Fake think after listening. So I can just, like, wave at neighbors. But, um, but I will have headphones, but they're not listening to anything. And I'm just, like, actually listening to silence and yeah. being with myself and my own thoughts. And that is just, that's been a really valuable artistic practice mm. for me and just sort of, like, creative practice. So yeah. I recommend that for people. Like, be silent. Listen. Yeah. Listen to nothing sometimes. That's true because like in music, they're talking about so many different things and then now you're triggered thinking about that. Yeah. And it's just nice to listen sometimes to like the birds even, just yes, nature. Yes, the world. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and, not, and not have that, um, you know, those words coming into you with mm -hmm. lyrics and things. Or, right. Or, you know, the, a story or a podcast or the radio or whatever. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, cool. Yeah. So we are going to just get the audience up to speed now on yeah. your background. So can you talk about your first role in the industry? Well, I think I'm like a lot of artists and mm -hmm. arty people in that I do not remember a time I'm, that I wasn't making things. Right. Like that's just something that has been a part of my life. Mm -hmm. I also grew up in a family that was very, um, we were makers. Like we made things all the time and we were super entrepreneurial. I have a nice. lot of family members that had their own businesses. So that was a great you know, way to grow up. I didn't realize until I got a lot older how valuable that was and how rare because some people don't understand that you can make things. We were making baskets and clothes and brick walls, you know, yeah. like we oh made things, goodness. you know. And so for me growing up with that, I always made things. And I think my first, you know, sort of 
intro to the idea that I could make money as a, a creative person and make money mm -hmm. as an artist, I was taking art classes in high school and I had, was lucky that my art teacher was one of those art teachers that like wanted to get the students work out there. You know, he really worked hard. And so he, you know, there would be paintings in galleries, there would be paintings in shows, there'd be paintings in, you know, coffee shops and things. And one day I walked into the classroom and he's like, called my name. He's like, I have a check, you sold a painting. And oh, I didn't even remember awesome. that I'd put a price on it. I, at first I was like, what painting, where, you yeah. know? And I didn't have a bank account. I had to go open a bank account oh, to my put this check in. But I was like, well, wait, that's it. Like to me, I was like, wait a second. I love that. I love mm -hmm. making art. Somebody's gonna pay me to make art. Boom, I'm in. Like, um, yeah. that's it, I'm, I've decided. And so, you know, that was kind of my entree to it. And then after that, I ended up getting a job when I was, you know, a little bit older where I was working at a, like a parks facility that had a gallery and the director was really, really welcoming to all the young staff members. Like she, whenever she had a meeting, she would round us all up and be like, get your notebook, get your notebook. And, you know, we would go into like meetings with big people that were giving a lot of money to the gallery maybe, or somebody that was, you know, a, curator, a guest curator, and we would all have to sit there and listen. And so I became aware of all the different jobs. Like I was like, oh, that's what that person does. Got it. Oh, that person just finds financing for shows like this. You know, like this person coordinates programming about this arts event. This person organizes arts events. Mm -hmm. So I saw a lot of different careers and then I was like, oh, well, okay, maybe I could be an artist and do this, but there's other jobs too. Yeah. It was really interesting to see that. Yeah, so I think you. that's a cool experience. It's yeah. nice that you opened your bank account with money to actually put in it. Because <laughs> right. um, I'm pretty sure when I opened mine, I, I just had to like get right. $30 and put it in there. Um, but yeah, I think that's cool that you had that experience because I feel like whenever we're younger, it's like, oh, I can be a doctor or a lawyer, like just the things yeah. that you've seen on TV. Yeah. So it's nice to know that there was other jobs. Um, so I, I definitely, my family, like entrepreneurial, but yeah. not on un entrepreneurial, like you could sell real estate right. or own a printing shop, not like you could be an artist, you know, right. like that was definitely not an idea. So, um, so I, I you know, I, I feel for people who are like, my, I want to be an artist and my family doesn't get it. Yep. Nobody's family gets mm -hmm. it. Like even, you know, even in my family, which was super creative, they were like, oh, I don't know about that. Yeah. So, so what was that conversation like whenever you told them? I think I want to be an artist. I want to do this full time. Well, I don't know that I've had that conversation yet. So <laughs> um, I just did the things, you know, um, I, I did go to school for art. I was major, I majored in art and, um, but then, you know, I also really knew that one of the ways that artists also made money was by teaching. And so I decided to, you know, add on a state school an extra year and, and got my teaching certification. Artists are like the, the like, you know, first gig workers ever. I mean, for thousands of years, artists have been gig workers because you do the thing. You, you know, you paint the mosaic or you put the mosaic on the floor, you paint the mural on the wall in the church, and then you move on to the next job. You know, mm -hmm. artists are always having to be doing different things. That's not right. a new development. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I knew that I was going to need to do things like that already. So, you know, so I was like, well, I can teach and then I can also, you know, sell my work or do different types of work. And so, yeah, I haven't actually told my family that that's what I'm going to But I think I'm past that now. They're, yeah. they're fine. Yeah. Wouldn't be a surprise at <laughs> yeah, this point, no, I'm sure. No. Well, nice. Okay, no. so you were selling art in high school through your teacher. Mm -hmm. um, what would you say was like your next role? after that well so after after that and I you know I worked for that that sort of public you know it was a, it was a gallery slash um, teaching space mm -hmm. and then when I graduated from school I was an art teacher I was teaching in schools you know I taught um, adult like art, adult education art classes and then I taught little kids I taught high school kids you know I taught all different ages yeah. in different positions over the years but I always was doing something else on the side I mean it's not unusual for teachers to do something else over the summer or to do something else you know in you know in the off times or whatever with with their jobs but I was always doing something some other kind of thing you know I would get a job doing ill I did illustrations for a pan, uh, pamphlet for the USDA. You know, I did oh, like, I got awesome. a job painting some fish on a wall in a restaurant, you know, just little, again, that kind of gig sort of thing. 
And, you know, at the time they, I mean, at the time I was doing a lot of different things. I don't know that I had really like a specific plan for it that, you know, oh, this is the direction I'm taking my career. It just didn't mm -hmm. occur to me then. Um, but, you know, as I sort of, you know, over the years as I did more and more things, I realized like the thread behind all this is that I usually am teaching people. It's just something that I really enjoy doing. Yeah. Um, and I, you know, at one point I was selling, making and selling jewelry, really liked doing that, did that for several years, was selling all over the country, and then decided, oh, I could, you know, some people asked me to teach some classes, and I was like, oh, I could open a store and teach classes, teach people how to make jewelry, you know, and then that like got me back to that. So it's just, you know, in my sort of in my personality that's just something that I enjoy doing so I was always kind of coming back to that and and also trying new things I mean just you know that's I think part of being an artist right you want to yeah. try new things all the time so I think it's cool that you were doing all of that at the same time because then like you realize I think I actually like making jewelry more you didn't have to do a huge pivot to yeah, focus yeah. on that since you were already doing it well I think that with artists too often um I find with a lot of artists that I don't think I'm unusual. I think people mm -hmm. like to try new techniques and try new materials because even if you have a core thing that you stick with, mm -hmm. it it can sort of inform your, you know, your sort of core work. And so I was often doing those things, you know, trying out different things and then being like, well, okay, I've done that. You know, I, don't, I love it. I don't love it. Um, the jewelry for me was, it was, I was still painting, but it's a lot easier to sell a pair of earrings for $25 than a two or $3,000 painting. You know, right. it's just not like, it, it, it just the money is is faster. It's easier mm -hmm. to make those sales. And so I, that was an intentional pivot. I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna do the story making because it, it makes more. Now, you know, I fell into the trap that a lot of artists sometimes fall into, which is I got so busy doing that that I didn't do my, you know, I wasn't doing my other work. I wasn't doing the, you know, the other things that I wanted to do. But, um, but you can get back to it. You know, yeah. Get back to it. Okay. So then after doing the jewelry making, do you still do jewelry making now? Mm, so weirdly, no. I mean, I have a lot of materials. I, yeah. I ha when I was doing jewelry making and then I ended up opening a store. We taught classes, had, you know, mm -hmm. had a bead store, you know, taught a bunch of classes, taught a bunch of people to make jewelry, taught a bunch of people to, you know, do other things like that. And um, I actually had the store, the longest sort of part of my art career really was having that store. I had the store for about 17 years. And then I just, you know, it was time. It was time to do something else. And so we moved on. My, my husband and I both were working in the business and we just, you know, we really were like, we don't ever get to travel. We've got a store, mm -hmm. you know. Retail is a whole different animal. You know, it's a whole different business. So, um, so then we moved on from that. And I really realized I did want to get back to that teaching. You know, I really mm -hmm. wanted to get back to sort of telling people how to do things. But because of all that experience I've had in business, I find that I get, you know, I was getting so many questions from artists. They're like, well, how do I price my work? How do I, you know, how do I actually make a profit at this? And again, going back to that, like, on, you know, that entrepreneurial background, like I'm, yes, I'm an artist, but I also am like, oh, no, you got to do your accounting. Like you mm -hmm. got to like add your stuff up. You know, you have to, to keep track of your numbers, you yeah. know, if you want to make it a real business. So so that's where I've been lately. I mean, I do work for myself, too, mm -hmm. but I'm not selling my artwork. I'm really focusing on that sort of that sort of education and support of artists. Yeah. So. And can you talk a little bit about what you do at Triangle Artworks as well? Because I know we have kind of similar jobs and we like do. educational <laughs> events. Yeah. So. Yeah. And that's what I do at Triangle yeah. Artworks is I work either either sometimes I'm just advising artists and teaching artists and teaching classes or I'm finding artists that you know I might find an artist that's really great at figuring out their marketing and their promotions for their work and talk to that artist and say hey let's can we do a workshop you know can do you want to come and talk um, we've got some really great local arts podcasters in the area you know do you want to talk to these podcasters about your work you know how can we get that information out there mm -hmm. um, artists I you know I feel like artists often want to learn from other artists and so we are always you know I'm always looking for somebody that's like really great at teaching an artist how to do taxes another you know an artist that's good at taxes right. teaching an artist how to do taxes so yeah. I think it can be really helpful so now I get to create those events I get to sort of create those educational experiences I'm working on a project right now with um, an artist David Wilson who's out of Durham we're doing this really great project for artists that want to transition into doing their art on a big public art scale oh how awesome yeah so you know like a painter printmaker who mm -hmm. does small scale pieces you know 
if you think about it, when you drive by these big buildings downtown and there's this giant metal sculpture outside, well, that might have started as a painting or a sketch in someone's sketchbook. How does an artist get from doing small scale work to doing those big public projects? Yeah. And so we're working on that right now, which is really super exciting. And that is I can't so wait. Exciting. Yeah. Yeah. So can people who are watching, can they find that on triangleartworks.com or is there, is it not up yet? Well, the public art, the public art project will be, um, that those classes will be coming out in January of 2022. I don't know if you want me to say dates. Awesome. Yeah. Um, and that will, that will be available for people to sign up for, I believe in December, that's going out through the city of Durham. So cool. they'll, you know, there's an application process for that. People have, you, you have to already be making art. It's not mm -hmm. for somebody that's, you know, hasn't already been making and selling mm -hmm. their art a little bit. Um, but it's it's really going to go deep into some of those things, the budgeting and the types of, um, you know, to, to submit for a big 80 or $90,000 project, you've really got to have a package. And so yeah. we're really going to help artists get to that point. So that's an awesome. exciting thing. Yeah, you mentioned, um, you know, how you grew up around a lot of entrepreneurs and you found yourself being an entrepreneur, can you talk a little bit about that for people who are unsure if they want to go the independent route and just kind of explain what that experience was like? I know you obviously had some background with your family, yeah. um, but can you just like explain the difference between being an entrepreneur versus working for an organization? Oh yeah, sure, because artists, there's a lot of jobs. You don't mm -hmm. just have to carve your own path. You right. know, some for some artists, that's great. Like that's what they wanna do. They want to, you know, move in a lot of different directions. They want to be responsible. They wanna be their own boss. That is great, but there are other ways. There's definitely other, you know, methods. Particularly here in the Triangle, we have so many companies right now that are interested in, interested in getting artists for like gaming. Gaming companies are hiring like crazy. So if you have illustration skills, you know, if you're, a, you know, you need to definitely have some facility with digital. Um, you know, working digitally. You, you know, if somebody came to me and was like, "Well, I really just love painting," and I, you know. I, I don't really like working, you know, on my computer. That's maybe not a great fit for you, but but for folks that are able to work digitally and like working digitally, those gaming companies are super interested, and they're hiring artists. Awesome. Um, we also have a lot of design companies here based in the Triangle. Big, you know, graphic design houses, big marketing companies. All of those companies have in-house artists, and those jobs are, you know, it's a little more secure. Um, also, I think when you're first starting out, that can be a great way to go because you mm -hmm. you gain just like I was talking about my job when I worked at that gallery, you know, that facility where I learned about those different roles and I had a boss who was willing to sort of teach me those things. Those kind of jobs for somebody that's young and just starting out, especially if you got to convince those parents, you know, like right. I need this job <laughs> in the arts, um, that, you know, at least it's a job. Like, you know, their parents understand that. They're like, oh, right. okay, I get it. You've got a paycheck. You know, they maybe don't know what you do, but they know that it's a job. Yeah. And, and also you get exposure to a lot of different things. Yeah, that's so, really cool. We're yeah. going to have to talk about the gaming piece yeah, a little bit more yeah. than that. I definitely think people should hear about that. Um, I do kind of want to talk about like a day in your life or a week in your life um, ah. since you are at Triangle Artworks and you do independent consulting. Can you talk about what your day looks like? Well, I, because I'm most creative in the mornings, I do try to carve out some time. Um, you know, I'm, I'm a big schedule keeper and a time tracker and I think if you're if you work for yourself or you know if you you know if you work in your own home I've worked from home prior to COVID you know I've been working like out of an office for a long time or I come here actually to Frontier and work and co-work yeah um, but you, you know I, I track my time so I do carve time out for myself in the mornings first thing where I can sort of work on whatever my most creative project the project that needs like the biggest amount of my brain mm. for the day and I set a timer, I set a timer on my watch, or I set a timer on my phone, or I do something to like make myself focus for, you know, an hour, hour and a half on that. And then I try to, you know, spend some time doing meetings. I mean, you know, there's so many, part of my job, and I think part of a lot of jobs right now is like the endless Zoom meetings. Like you're just like, yes. oh my gosh, one more <laughs> Zoom meeting. But, um, but, you know, I try to not, I try to schedule those after I know that that creative time in my day will be passed because I, generally don't feel like I need my most creative energy in a Zoom meeting. Right. Um, you know, I'm, I'm able to just, you know, kind of step back a little bit. And I try to put um, breaks in there too, you know, be out. I think we're so fortunate here in the Triangle, right? Like our weather's amazing, mm -hmm. you know, most of the year. Um, I grew up in the Midwest, so okay. the idea that I could want to be outside anytime between October and, October and March is insane to me. Yeah. I still am not 
I've been here, you know, for eight decades, but I still can't get over that. I'm like, oh, it's a beautiful day in October. <laughs> get outside. Yeah. yeah. So I try to do some of that during the day. And, um, you know, and then I teach. I teach classes and I do consulting with artists. So um, I'm often teaching a class. You have to have classes when people can take them. So they tend to be at night, you know, on the weekends and things like that. So I usually, uh, I'm often teaching in the evenings, which I like. Yeah, that yeah. makes sense. Yeah. Um, what would you say are challenges that you often face in your role specifically or just in the industry? Well, so I my role now is I'm essentially considered like an arts administrator. So this is, you know, I'm doing, I'm working in the arts, but I'm not working mostly as an art producer. Mm -hmm. So a challenge that I often find is because I'm working for a nonprofit. We are thinking, constantly thinking about money issues. Um, you don't find that in, you know, if you have a job at a gaming company or a marketing company, maybe budgeting is not so much part of your issue. But, you know, working for a nonprofit, we're always looking for um, companies that want to support our work. You know, we don't ask, we really, our little motto is that we take artists' work seriously. So we don't ask artists to work for free for us. You know, if I have an artist that is coming to teach a class to other artists, I'm going to pay them, you know, right. so, but we have to find funding for that. You know, we have to figure out how that's going to happen. And so that's a part of my job that I didn't anticipate. I have to say, like when I, you know, definitely when I was younger and I thought, you know, to like what, when I would think about what arts administration or, you know, th this type of work would look like, I wouldn't have thought that, that sort of thinking about that kind of funding would be such a big part of it. Yeah. No, but it is important. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. And then what do you love the most about your work? I feel like there's obviously probably so many things. Oh, I could do this like 40 things. Yes, <laughs> if you had to choose one thing, what would um, it be? I probably just meeting artists and getting to know so many artists. Um, you know, I'm naturally like a social person. Mm -hmm. You know, my I've always been, you know, I'm lucky to be that, I think, you know, it's, I feel lucky to be sort of an extrovert. And so I love being able to meet an artist and, you know, when, when an artist is like, well, would you come to my studio and talk to me? I'm like, oh my gosh, thank you so much. You're like, yes, I want to get out of the house. <laughs> well, also I just love getting in people's workspaces, yeah. you know, like that is just such an exciting thing for me when somebody's like, hey, come to my dance studio or come to my, you know, painting studio. And I get to come in and like, be like ooh, there's your brushes. Ooh, <laughs> that's where you keep the dance shoes. You know, like it's just super interesting interesting to me you know to see about how people organize their workspaces and you know and to be in art arty places like that so yeah that's yeah. really cool yeah okay so you were mentioning about funding being um, a challenge that you often face in your current role I do want to talk about pay for artists so do you oh, have yeah. any tips to share with artists who decide to go that independent route on pricing their work I know this is something that you typically do yeah this is something that's like super close to my heart because mm -hmm. I see so many artists that are like well I don't know you know I they don't it's a with with when you're pricing your own artwork it's almost uh, you're evaluating your own self-worth right. you know so people have a lot oftentimes I will see really amazing painters or amazing filmmakers or amazing dancers and they're like well I don't know I mean I, I don't know that I'm worth that much artists tend to, to undervalue what they do because they love it you know, so the example I always give, though, is that, you know, a surgeon might really love cutting people up, but they don't charge less for it. You right. know, they still charge the what they should charge. So yeah. so I, I really recommend to artists that they're really paying attention. Again, I mentioned those numbers like you have to keep track of things. You have to write down all of your expenses. You have to pay attention to how much time you spend on things. You know, mm -hmm. there are formulas. There are ways to figure out how to price your artwork so that you know at your base like your baseline prices so that you're not losing money yeah. so that you're making a profit now where you go up from that it could be stratospheric i mean we all hear about artists that you know paintings that sell for millions and millions of dollars that certainly happens um what we don't hear about though is the painters the artists painters the jewelry makers that just they they make a living you know they make a good living they're not you know their jewelry might not be selling for you know five thousand dollars for a pair of earrings but they're able to sell their earrings and they make money you know they might be you know making weavings and they're not ten thousand dollar weavings but they're making money you know mm -hmm. so I, I think that's that you know paying attention to those numbers kind of making sure that you're not losing money on your artwork when you're first starting out is super important yeah that's nice to know because I've heard like 
with certain things, maybe like products, people will say, well, you should start with a low price and then over time, once you build up the clientele and people know about you, then you raise the price. Do you mm, agree with that or you think? Mm, no. No? I mean, okay. Well, yes and no. So you can definitely start with a lower price, right. but you always need to know what your costs are. So your price can never be below what it costs you to make that thing. Mm. You know, just like you do not go into a store and buy a pair of jeans and get them for less than it costs the company to make them just right. because you've never heard of those jeans before. That's not how that works. Yeah. It's really not. So you really, as an artist, when you're making your work, you need to be keeping track of your expenses. You need to keep track of your time. You need to know sort of what your what your costs are associated with that and you need to pay attention to your pricing and that's something that you know that's a training thing that doesn't doesn't exist in art schools they don't you know they'll teach you how to blow glass they'll teach you how to throw a pot they don't teach you how to price things they just don't yeah. it's not part of the you know the learning so that's kind of that is actually why triangle artworks exists <laughs> basically is to that's help with awesome. those types of things yeah and then the other question i had surrounding pay was have you found there to be any pay discrepancies between artists who work independently versus artists who work within an organization uh, yes and no i think that you are um so when you're when you're first starting out and you're working for yourself mm -hmm. um you may have the option of having another job you know like i was an art teacher you know you could be doing something else so you sort of have the ability to ramp up you know your work if you're working for somebody else you're going to kind of come in and be at their pay scale whatever their pay scale is you know whatever amount of money that they're paying for that position um, until you get a name you know at that particular company or in that particular niche of art mm -hmm. um, you're going to kind of be stuck in that pay scale based on that company now that is saying that if you're working for yourself, you're also having to pay for your health insurance. You know, you don't, you know, you have to handle your own retirement savings and all of those things. Whereas if you go to work for a big company, that stuff is usually handled for you. Yeah. So there's, you know, there's definitely pluses and minuses. Um, one thing for artists is to, to be your own boss, to do it independently, you have to have a certain um, appetite for risk that, you know, it is an entrepreneurial thing. Whereas if you go the route where you're working for a company, you're an illustrator, you're a designer, you know, you're working in, you know, you've got a gaming, a job in a gaming company and you're doing, I mean, I, I know somebody who just does bricks, <laughs> just does bricks. That's all she does, <laughs> you know, but she's happy and she's got a great job, pays really well. But, but if you're, if that's your job, there's so much more security because your paycheck comes, right? You get that paycheck, you've got that retirement, you've got that health insurance. So it's just, it, there's definitely some personality differences, I think, that mm -hmm. people just need to kind of understand how they feel about it emotionally. Yeah. yeah. And then the last question I had around pay, I know I said the last one was the last one, but I thought <laughs> it was okay. <laughs> <laughs> so is it common for artists to have to sign a non-compete whenever they're working for an organization? Um, so you mean like if you were to go get an illustrator job for a company? Company that mm -hmm. you wouldn't be able to do outside work yes um, it depends um, typically the work that you're doing as an illustrator for a company is very specific so they may say that you're not allowed like for instance if I were to get a job working for a greeting card company they may say that I was not allowed to also do work for another greeting card company or I wasn't allowed to sell my own greeting cards they're typically not gonna say hey you can't paint or hey, you can't sketch, or yeah. hey, you can't, you know, do your your own personal art, um, because that would be impossible to stop. You know, I mean, that would be like telling a, you know, a, a professional golfer they couldn't go play mini golf on the side. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, those are those are different things. So, so, um, so there will there often is some kind of um, a little bit of uh, restriction, but it's not a restriction from the whole art world. It's just a restriction from that thing that you're specifically being thing. paid for. Yeah, okay. yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Okay, so now I want to talk about the route for young adults. So let's say that I was a young high school student or college age student and I loved creating art, but I just didn't know exactly what I wanted to do next. What advice would you give me? Well, definitely get some jobs that are art related in some way. And mm -hmm. if that's working at a gallery, if that's, you know, working in some kind of arts facility, even if you have to do some sort of a volunteer job, just you need to get some experience to learn different types of jobs. Um, if you are, if you really want a creator job, though, if you really want to do, if you want to be making, you know, you want to be an illustrator, 
you want to be um, you know doing things like that where you're doing work doing the artwork for someone else make as much artwork as you can so try different jobs make art as much as possible um, we're lucky in that we have so many ways now to share artwork you know you, people you can for free do a website you know put your artwork out there you can you know share your artwork on social media that's a really great way to like get your artwork out there and you know make sure that you're making things but definitely make just make just lots create. of art do lots of creating yeah okay yeah. great advice are there any degrees or certifications you suggest that students should get to be successful or mm -hmm. is it kind of the thing that it's up to them it, it definitely depends if someone is a you know and I'm, I'm mostly talking about visual artists. Obviously, there are performing arts jobs, but I'm really, you know, my experience and sort of our focus here today has been visual arts. You, you definitely want to um, try to have, get as many connections as possible. And so one way to get connections is to be taking those classes. You know, if you're doing a university program, that's great. If you're doing game, if you're interested in gaming arts, we are so fortunate. Our community college here right in, in Central North Carolina, both Wake and... Um, Orange County Community Colleges have really great gaming arts programs, really strong. Even if that's not your degree that you're going for, maybe take in a class or two just to make some connections, make sure you're up to date on what the, you know, what the terminology is, that you know it, especially if you're coming into something like that. Maybe you have that entrepreneurial family, but nobody's an artist. Mm -hmm. You know, you need to make sure you know the terms, you know the language, you sort of can speak to people when you're looking for those jobs. Yeah. So speaking of gaming, I know we talked about it a little bit in the beginning, but I wanted to get into that a little bit more. Yeah. So you're talking about the community colleges. Would you say that's like the first step to getting into that gaming industry? Well, I would say that the first, probably the first step to that is if you are playing video games, which maybe you already are, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, yeah. How do you not, how do you not, <laughs> you know, right now? But um, so, so the first step is sort of identifying all those jobs. And um, this is a great time to say, if you ever, if you ever have your family and they're like, well, that's not really a job. Like how many people are really get video game artists? Go to the credit screen on any game or honestly any Hollywood movie. Those artists, there's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of them on every game. There's hundreds and hundreds on any movie. You know, you can, any big Hollywood movie with any special effects, there are hundreds of special effects artists. Those are actual jobs. People make real money doing those. Yeah. And I think it's hard, it can be hard for parents who don't come from that world to understand that that, oh, that's a job. Like somebody makes money doing that. Yeah. So, yeah, so I definitely, um, you know, getting in touch with those school programs can be really great. Um, you can also just major, you know, if you wanted to go into the video game industry, you could also just major in painting or drawing. You know, having that fine arts background is also valuable. You're gonna wanna definitely have some tech experience though. You're gonna need to understand how to produce artwork digitally. So whether you've got those programs, those drawing programs that you're using on your iPad or, you know, your, your desktop, you wanna make sure you're understanding how to use those programs and they're not, they're not scary to you. You know how to use those yeah. tools. You know how to use that digital pen and all those things, because that's how that work's produced. It's not work made with an actual paintbrush anymore. Yeah. Are there certain programs that, if someone who completely doesn't even know what program to start with, is there a program that you would suggest they start out playing around on? Well, I mentioned Wake Tech. They have a really great gaming arts program, mm -hmm. and I highly recommend it. They do summer sessions that are sort of an overview, and I believe that those are available for anyone who's 16 or older. So even if you're a high school student, and you know, depending on what high school you're at, your art teacher may or may not have uh, you know, any understanding of that. Your high school may not offer those types of classes, but you can access those programs at Wake Tech. Super valuable, really. Um, and if you're from outside of Wake County, you can still do it. You just have to pay a little extra. I, you know, I would say to any parent, if that's a career that your kid is interested in, letting them get some of that education before they make that decision is super valuable. Yeah, well, that's awesome information. Thanks for sharing that because yeah. the community colleges, um, those programs are super helpful. Yeah. Um, is there something that you wish you knew early on in your career? Oh, boy. Um, I... I think I wish I had a little more confidence in my own work. You know, I think at first I was always, um, I did a lot of listening to people from the outside, like aiming me in different directions and um, didn't always have, just have enough confidence in my own work. So I wish that like, if I could go back in time and like whisper something in my ear, I'd be like, it's gonna be fine. You're gonna make it like, just, you know, focus, do what you wanna do. Don't, you don't have to listen to everybody. So, yeah. yeah, that's great advice. Yeah. 
Although uh, here I am giving advice and saying don't listen to everyone's advice. Yeah, but that's great advice. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so then they won't be thinking that later on. Yeah, yeah. Um, I know you mentioned earlier that you are from the Midwest. Mm -hmm. How has that inspired what you create? Well, that's an interesting question. Wow. Um, I was not expecting that yeah, one. Yeah, sorry. No. That one was just um, yeah. kind of off the top um, of my head. Well, so I'm from Midwest, so I'm like, I like flatness, which is kind of strange. Um, you know, it's... It's actually not super hilly here, but like, you know, there's definitely mountains in Western North Carolina, but I'm like, I, I like, I'm just like horizon lines are really important to me. So I am, I do say when I'm painting, like that is one of my, when I'm making visual art, I am often like the first thing I will put on a page is that long flat horizon line. Like it's just a, it's, it's kind of a thread that is important to me. And I think that's probably a Midwestern thing. You know, the sky and the, mm -hmm. the earth are like, it's, it's half. You know, yeah. <laughs> it's half there, so yeah. Sets your foundation yeah, for yeah, the art. Yeah. Well, wonderful. The last thing we're going to finish with is the final three. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so okay. you ready for the yeah. final Except three? You already did one of my final threes. Like, you already asked me a book recommendation. I did. Yeah, so. Okay. <laughs> I think, okay, so it's something for them to read or watch. So, do you want to think of something for them to watch? Mm. And then I'll ask it like, Rapidy in a minute Later while you're on. after you think. Yeah, I have to think about this. It could even be like a YouTube video or something on like PBS. Yeah. Or anything. I mean, I just we just watched Dune. It's super good, by the way. Really, I'm going God, tomorrow. It's so good. Oh, we just watched it at home, but yeah. it was really good. Like I want to see it in an actual theater now. Yeah. Yeah, it's very good. I used to like never go to the movie theater, and then. I was like, eh, I can watch it at home. And then recently during the pandemic, I'm like, it's fun to go to the movies again. Yeah, so I've been going. Yeah, yeah. But I'll have to see that. Yeah. I'm now like definitely like, oh, I like to watch it at home because I can turn on the subtitles. Yeah. Because I'm one of those people, and this is not an age thing. It's been my mm -hmm. whole life. I'm like, what did they just say? What yeah. They say? Like, <laughs> you know when they're whispering in movies? Yeah. It's annoying. And that movie's a lot of whispering. That's okay. what I'm saying. Good to know. I'll have like yeah. my Be ears missing. ready. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, okay. So rapid fire questions. Okay. Okay. Mm. Okay, yeah. You got it? Okay, mm -hmm. so you're gonna look into this camera and I'm oh, just gonna right. ask them. Okay. All right, so rapid fire. Something for them to read or watch. Um, well, if you've not yet seen Lupin, it's on Netflix. It's There's like two seasons. It's French, so you have to read your subtitles if you don't speak French, but it's really funny. It's witty, like this is something that's good for adults and kids. It's sort of like a crime series, but you're following the criminal, but he's also a good guy. I don't want to say any more, but it's really, really good. <laughs> okay, yeah. a topic for them to research deeper in the industry. Ooh, um, well, I think that one thing that if you want to be an artist, and this is whether you're wanting to go in, work for someone else or work for yourself, you need to research business basics. You need to like understand the basics of, you know, doing your accounting, like, you know, pricing your work, all of those things. I think that is something that for every artist, you need to be researching that. You need to understand that when you get started. And then I love the advice that you gave earlier about just trusting yourself early on in your career. You know, mm -hmm. you would go back and whisper to yourself and say like, you got this, you're good. Don't listen to all the outside voices. But is there a final piece of advice for them that you have for them on their journey? Well, I think one thing to remember is that um, it's hard. Like art is work. It, so at first, when you're first making art and you're young and you're like, you know, messing around with the paint on the paper, or you're gluing all the things together, it just feels like fun. But there is a point when you're making it your job that it's work. So you need to not lose that spark. Like always let, give yourself the opportunity to play with artwork. Do different things. Try different techniques, try different materials. Go, you know, and just paint all in red for a weekend or do something crazy and fun. Don't lose your spark because as much as it can be a real job and you can make real money, you don't want it to just be a boring real job. You still want to like it. You know, you still want to love that thing that you that brought you to it. So, so I would say just don't lose the spark. Keep playing with it. Yeah. Keep the passion there. Yeah. Well, wonderful. Yeah. Thank you so much for coming. And Aww. I know you made a troop out here because you have a broken ankle, but this <laughs> yeah. has been great. And I think it's really going to be fun impactful to for the, <laughs> for the um, people watching. So I hope you. so. Yeah. Hey guys, if you enjoyed this video, please subscribe down below. We're going to be posting new videos every month. I'm going to be interviewing a different expert from a different career field. Um, that may interest you. So keep an eye out for those videos by subscribing. Thank you so much for watching.